Hello, good evening everyone. Hi, I'm Molly Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Royal Society of Literature and I am thrilled to welcome you to this very special conversation between Fiona Shaw and Patrick McCabe in partnership with our hosts, the British Library. Hello to everyone watching online as well, uh, wherever you are, and to those of you joining us via our friends Tickets for Good, um, who provide free tickets to NHS and charity workers. We're really glad that you've joined us here this evening as well. There could be no better way to celebrate World Book Day than with two legends of the page, stage and screen. Um, I have been looking around and I am slightly disappointed not to see more costumes of favourite characters, though my favourite to dress up as is Murphy from Samuel Beckett, so maybe I can see a couple of those here. And you shall be forgiven. Uh, so now that I've forgiven you all, you're welcome, uh, it's time to turn to our speakers. Uh, and it's truly my favourite World Book Day ever, uh, being able to introduce Patrick and Fiona. Patrick McCabe was born in 1955 in Clones, County Monaghan. He is the author of The Butcher Boy, which won the Irish Times Irish Literature Prize for Fiction, The Dead School, Breakfast on Pluto, and others. The Butcher Boy and Breakfast on Pluto were both shortlisted for the Booker Prize and adapted into feature films by Neil Jordan. Winterwood was named the 2007 Hughes and Hughes Irish Independent, Irish Independent Novel of the Year. His most recent book is the verse novel Pogue Mahone, which I'm going to force everybody to buy after this, published by the wonderful Unbound, uh, who are also soon to release Patrick's next book, which is a black comedy entitled Golden Grove. I was expecting an ooh, an ooh, woo, okay, thank you. Uh, Patrick's going to be signing copies at the end of the conversation. Fiona Shaw was born in County Cork, Ireland and trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. She's one of the most recognized actors of her generation. She was awarded a CBE for services to drama in 2001. Fiona and Patrick first met 30 years ago during the making of the film adaptation of The Butcher Boy, in which Fiona plays Mrs. Nugent. We will be watching a short clip from the film in just a moment to set the scene, and then they're going to join us on stage to discuss the film, Patrick's latest books, and the importance of literature in both their lives. There's going to be a chance for you to ask your questions at the end, so please prepare them in the room, and please prepare them online as well. So we will be asking, asking questions in here and from our audience online too, and we'll get through as many as we can. So now before we get to hear from Fiona and Patrick, we've got a scene from The Butcher Boy for all of you. Of all the wrong things I'd done, I suppose the apples were the first. They started all the trouble. And Francie Brady didn't need any old snake to give him one. He robbed them himself. Oh, Francie! Come on, Joe! Come on! Come on! Come on, it's up there, hey! Don't worry, keep on stubby, I got ya! Oh, fuck! Come on, Francie, get me one! Come on! Yeah, right, Joe! Oh. Well, how many have we got now? I'll just keep shaking, Francie! I'll shake the living shit out of her, Joe! Another hundred! And who butts in only Philip Nugent, his head full of amazing facts like the boiling point of water and the number of eyes on a fly head? I'm not sure what you said, Philip, isn't it? Doing a bit of reading now. Comics, Francie. You've got to have them, Joe. Tell you what, Philip. Guess what? One of your Maz Cox's pickings. Yeah. For all of them comics. It's only fair, Philip. No, Joe, he's really that bad. What are you doing? Jesus, Francie, get out! Get out! Yes. What chances he got living in a pigsty, but if he's seen me and my fellow again, there'll be trouble, mark my words. Pigs! 
But one thing she was right about, he sure could drink. He was the best drinker in the town. And how? Man has realized his dream. Now he must control it. shadow of our former selves. <laughs> the best drinker in the town. The best drinker in the town. Look at him now. Look at him now. <laughs> yeah. There was a time, Fiona. There was a time. Um, can I start? Yeah, please do. Uh, I was... Uh, obviously, we haven't met since the butcher boy, which is, you know, 145 years ago, but... It, um, I was, you know, re-looking at it and re-watching the film today, and also, of course, uh, Paul Mahone, which is something else. Uh, and I hope we get on to the discomfort and the disquiet that it, that it, 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 it sort of... There are lots of things I've forgotten in my life, and they're all in Pogue Mahone. <laughs> you know, not, not that I was in Killyburn uh, in, in such a... In such a uh, destitution, terrible situation, but the emotional atmosphere I remember completely. But I just want to begin by saying that I had, had been reading um, Fintan O'Toole's wonderful book about we don't, know, we don't Know Ourselves, which is really a portrait of Ireland since 1958, which is when I was born. And in it he says that by the late 70s, you probably, you probably read this, in the late 70s, in order to get a condom in Ireland, you had to get a prescription from the doctor and he said, because it's the only country in which the condom was a medicine. <laughs> but also, he said, what it really means is was not really to do just with Catholicism at the time, but it was to do with the fact that the, the Taoiseach at the time had said, it's an Irish solution to an Irish problem, <laughs> which meant that we wouldn't have the same solution as anybody else, because we wouldn't have the same problem as anyone else. So we'd act on the law when we wanted to and not when we didn't. And it is that surrealism that I think we were all brought up in. And the book is full of that, isn't it? An instability yeah. of reality. That's what it It's like that all the time. Well, well certainly in uh, Pogue Mahone, and maybe to some extent in The Butcher Boy, that kind of uh, sort of superficial socio-realist analysis is not any great interest to me, you know what I mean? Because in a way, <clears throat> It is an Irish solution to an Irish problem, and we're not, we're not going to go back to the dissolution of the monasteries, you know, and the rise of the British middle class and various other things and the famine and so on, but after 1847, should we say, there was a, a kind of a, what, what you might call theological project with the building of Catholic churches as a means of giving dignity back to a destroyed people. So when I hear those stories, I, I understand the whimsy of them, and I understand how it's different to England and everything else. But now that the horse is well and truly flogged, you know, <laughs> and that uh, the, the churches are pretty much empty anyway, and now that we have a completely and utterly secularized country, I think maybe we should start to perhaps look back at these things with a little bit more intelligence, yeah. if you don't yeah. mind me yeah. saying so. I don't mean what you've just said, but generally speaking, there is a a rather embarrassing tendency to embrace, you know, the consumer capitalist neoliberalist world as if we have entered upon some wonderful era of enlightenment when young boys <laughs> seem to be hanging themselves right, left and centre, people be put in jails for, yeah. you know, abusing themselves on Instagram and live streams and you could argue, well, the poor old lady in the front pew of a small Irish country church with her missile was I suppose, I'm experiencing the same kind of mysticism in her own way through the medieval stained glass and her private little missile and her medallion, as we now are congratulating ourselves, it was just different. Yeah. And in Pope Mahone, I would really insist upon that if someone has a miraculous medal or a scapular, 
as they have in Italy and they have in Mexico and many other places. It isn't something that we should be laughing at. No. It's something that we should be investigating because it is the inheritance of an awful lot of people. Yeah. So Pogue Mahone, whatever else it is, looks at this kind of post-famine world in collision with this narcissistic, self-congratulatory, neoliberalist shambles that we seem to have, as <laughs> far as I can see. So count me out on the, the uh, funny little Irish one. Uh, funny enough, I did think about that, that po post the famine, there was a terrible um, vacuum in Ireland um, because the Irish, for understandable reasons, had begun to distrust the British. <laughs> And the church just swept in and filled that vacuum. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, what, in Pogue Mahon, there is that sort of inheritance that the couple that we get to know so well, Dan and Una, that uh, their mother is also, it just goes ricocheting back, doesn't it, to something that was never really steady for the previous maybe 100 years. You know. well. I remember thinking along those lines, you know, particularly during that period of kind of social upheaval of hippie dom and drug taking and everything else and almost being embarrassed by this inheritance of meeting an old lady who was the mother of an artist of some distinction at the time, a modernist artist, and she was married to another one of the finest artists in Ireland, actually, who kind of was influenced by Larry Rivers and Rosenberg and various other people like that. And she almost like was a standard looking Irish lady, she had a shawl and long grey hair and I think I was stoned or something and I was saying about this absurd architecture, you know, of these huge cathedrals, you know, how gross they were. And she said, what do you mean they were gross? Yeah. And it was the first time I'd actually be heard anyone challenge any of this. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, that great big Palladian derivative. She said, did you ever stop to think that the pennies that paid for that cathedral were a means of saying after the Catholic Emancipation Act, we can't be as big as you. Yeah. It was an act of defiance, she said, and maybe, young man, you should learn some lessons and start to read your history books. And I shut up pretty quick after that. Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah. A sort of a, yeah, a nouveau enthusiasm. In, in Cove, in County Cork, there's a, a Cove Cathedral is a Pugin design, but it's much bigger than the town. <laughs> the church is bigger than the town. But there was a period where they also began to put up Virgin Mary statues, because Virgin Mary appears in the, the Butcher Boy very powerfully. Um, but <laughs> instead of getting local sculptors to, to, to sculptors to make these statues, you know, they bought them all off the peg from Italy. So I think there was a kind of a rabid enthusiasm, well, so no all those that, pennies went to Italy rather than to our... And every parish was in competition to see who of the best, best Virgin Mary statue. Yeah. Like, when I'm coming across here, it doesn't mean that I don't see the fun of this thing. Yes. And, um, you know, as, as long as we take it as seriously as we do, well, they, we can have the foundation of that, but, yes. you know, I want the circus on top of that as yes. well, yes. you know, because uh, the story of the Blessed Virgin in The Butcher Boy actually comes from a story that my wife's father told me. Um, um, it was about a guy in the west of Ireland. Um, as, they, as you know, they had um, nicknames, uh, probably still do in many places, but mostly it belongs to that period. And his name was the Dummy Costello. And he used to sit down in this bar and uh, it was the Marian year, you think, in 1958 or whatever it was. And apparently the news went out that the Blessed Virgin Mary was coming to appear personally to the Dummy Costello. Yeah. Don't know how this happened, but anyway, he got the word through, the, through his prayers and intercession that the Mother of God was going to arrive. You know what a turlock is? It's a big kind of lake that disappears, but she was going to appear over this turlock. It was called the Swally Hole. <laughs> And at six o'clock, apparently, our lady was to make her appearance. And he was down in the bar, and people were coming in, buying him whiskies, and it's a great day for everybody, isn't it? And of course, as often happens in Ireland, all of this is a load of bollocks, and everybody knows it. <laughs> like, you know, I'm sure you get the same in uh, 
the stories of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, yes. you know, like where yes. when it was fated uh, in the UK and in Europe, you know, as magic realism, it was a big vogue yeah. in, the, in the 80s, you know, and Marquez said, I don't know what everybody's going on about, you know, like magic realism. When I say that the room filled up with butterflies or the ducks said, how are you doing? It uh, <laughs> that's, just, that's just what my grandmother told me, yeah, and I yeah. wrote it down. Like, what's everybody going on about magic realism for? Yeah. But of course, everybody in the UK and Ireland then started writing magic realism, you know, and I think it was... Uh, get, uh, Ben Oakley said, no, you can't go down the street, but someone, there are toads singing mad. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, to get back to the Domi Coslo, the time was coming anyway, and they all trooped down to the, it was about five to six, and said, like in the movie, like, near time now for the Blessed Virgin, everybody please, hail Mary, holy Mary, all, and all those rhythms, and they waited and waited and waited, didn't show. Yeah. Yes, it is a, and the blame all descended on the Dummy Costello. I mean, you couldn't blame the Blessed Virgin for being late. Oh, I mean, no, no, no. Obviously, some other She's metaphysical dead. reason for it. So the Dummy Costello didn't get any more drink. Well, actually, he did, because when my father-in-law was going home at one o'clock in the morning, they were uh, driving back across the Midlands, and they saw this figure <laughs> clambering out of the ditch, and it was the Dummy Costello, as drunk as any human being could ever be. <laughs> And they were driving him back to his little house up the lane as well. <laughs> no sign of the Blessed Virgin anyway, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's how, that's how deep all that went, you know what I mean? <laughs> Except, in the other respect, it does go deep, you know what I mean? Oh, no, that that you can have uh, both things co yeah. co cohabiting in my head anyway. And the same with Pope Mahone is that um, I loved, I mean, there, there were things in it that gave me the shivers. Fellas wearing cheesecloth shirts. Do you remember cheesecloth <laughs> shirts? <laughs> Going up Kilburn. Um, but that kind of people being cool, but not being cool, and people having histories. I mean, that, there's much less religion in that, actually, isn't there? Because Troy, yeah. Troy the lover, he's not so religious. He's more, more of a no, well, god on his own right. Yeah, the people you're moving out of. But they, they the central character carries a version of history, you know. And I was wondering, just, I, I haven't figured it out myself, I mean, the whole uh, Irish Catholic sort of view. But then again, there are the same kind of um, perplexities and complexities in London. And, and, and I came across a quote from George Orwell, and I was wondering what the, the audience might think of it, because it is germane to what we're saying. It's a very famous essay, actually. but. I've been reading this essay all my life, and I find it really, really interesting. And I was just wondering, not vis-a-vis not -vis Brexit or anything to do with that, but just generally what people think about the notion of history, you know? And it said, England is somehow bound up with solid breakfasts and bloomy Sundays, smoky towns and winding roads, green fields and red pillar boxes. It has a flavor of its own. Moreover, it is continuous. It stretches into the future and the past. There is something in it that persists as in a living creature. And I want to apply this to Ireland as well. What can the England of 1940 have in common with the England of 1840? I'll just repeat that because it's a phrase that I keep going back to. What can the England of 1940 have in common with the England of 1840. But then, what have you in common with the child of five whose photograph your mother keeps on the mantelpiece? Mm -hmm. Nothing, except that you happen to be the same person. Mm. It's very good, isn't it? It's very good. It's interesting, isn't it? Very, very, yeah. 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 So that doesn't come out of nowhere. It's, it, it was when I was trying to dig deep into the subconscious of what it was I was trying to say that, mm. that eventually came out as a sort of an epic narrative poem. And I wouldn't call it a poem. It's not a poem. It's something else. I don't know what it is. 
big long stream of vomit is what Bob Dylan would call it, which is what he called like a rolling stone. He wasn't being derisive, he was just trying to be honest, there was something like that. But when you're digging into the subconscious, it's axiomatic that you're going to be going into the minds of your parents and your grandparents and beyond. You don't know, sometimes you go further than you think, maybe even prenatal, you know, I don't know. But that's why that phrase, I think it is so um, resonant mm. for everyone, really, that photograph, mm. or any culture, really. I think the poetry in the book allows it to be, you, you, you often repeat things, and I love the rep repetitions. You know, you go, is that the case? Is that the case? <laughs> you know, is that the case? And somehow rhythm allows you to do that, which, which maybe proves. Well, it has the beat of a bow run. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. That repeats all yeah. the time. So, yeah. <clears throat> for, I don't know how other novelists work, but how I find it is you're trying all different keys, you're trying out even different instruments. And when I, began to realize it went from the most banal piece of nauseating social realism of a young hippie in London that you wouldn't show to anyone when you get the rhythm going. And musicians will tell you when it, when it kicks in, like Dylan talks about when he got down to Nashville and what he was looking for was that high mercury sound. Yeah that he got on Blonde on Blonde. Well, before that, he didn't have it. Where it comes out of collaboration, it comes out of coincidence, it comes out of many things. But in my case, it was an overheard snatch of a boom, 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 and a six, eight rhythm. Yeah. And after that, it was okay. Except that whenever I showed it, anybody said, nobody's ever gonna publish this. <laughs> 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 but uh, fortunately, John Mitchinson and his wife, Rachel, published it, and they're here tonight, so I thank them for that. But it's very highly constructed as well. You've constructed them. It doesn't matter, um, you know, it's a very difficult time for writers who are doing things like this, believe me. Yeah. And I don't say that, I know plenty of people who are faced with this, and that, uh, that the whole notion of perception of what do we call high literature or literature is flattened out, you know, and it's the world of entertainment, and uh, people have no problem saying, yeah, it's brilliant or whatever it is, but we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. That's a common thing now, and sometimes they don't even bother responding to people. Yeah. So, I don't know, I'm sure it's not an awful lot different in the movie world. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's a curious time because uh, maybe in the digital age, li literature of, of this kind may be fighting for its life. I don't know. But its value, I, I don't know about the economics of it or the, the, way, the, the, the patterns of people's reading habits, but the value of that book or one is that we're finding it so hard to write recent history. But if somebody writes fiction and is so totally immersed in the subconscious of it as you are, it's incredibly valuable because I, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly, I can't kind of quote the book because it's a very hard book to quote. I mean, if you have sort of Margaret Rutherford coming out of one door, and as I was saying to you behind, is that Peter Scar's going to go, where do you go to, my lovely? I think, oh my God, I can't remember. I don't even want to remember that song, <laughs> when you're alone, and, and how good it was. But these fragments of memory of, of a dusty London that in, I, I, I think I came about t t t 10, I came in the early 80s, so, so the book has kind of done its story by then. But I was very disappointed in London because it was much shabbier than I thought it was going to be. And then this book absolutely captures that kind of meaningless Northwest London, hopeless kind of long, hot summers of, oh God, there was a kind of an oh God about it. And uh, I thought that, that it, you know, that is, and of course there's much more texture than that and it's much more full of feeling than that, but that uncomfortableness is just, nabbed in the book, and I don't think a history of London would get that. It depends on really what your background is, like because um, I had a couple of different versions of it, like I remember the first time I came, the troubles really were uh, mm. pretty, pretty heavy, and uh, I suppose I was following in the footsteps of one of these kind of would-be Flaneurs, I thought that I'd just wander into a West End theatre and say that I was really interested in the theatre of cruelty, you know. Right. You know. 
and uh, or you know Ionesco or someone. And, yeah, that that's really interesting. Come on, that it only a matter of days before yeah. you know. <laughs> Maybe doing your as, exercise. Uh, you know, in, um, <laughs> you know, uh, this had come from the one experience that I had of acting, which was in boarding school. We had a great teacher, a visionary teacher. There's always a visionary teacher, isn't there? Yeah. But here he was, and this kind of seminarian boarding school. And he was uh, very well versed in the theatre of the Royal Court at that time, John Osborne and John Arden. But he said, I want to put on this play, which was called America Hurrah, and it was by a guy called Jean-Claude von Italy. Now, nobody remembers it now, but it was a big thing on Broadway at that time, around 1966, I think it's broad. But this was pure theatre of the absurd. And he said, you know what, like, when you're a youngster and somebody trusts you to do something, but you better do it because if you don't, you've, you've lowered yourself in the right. And that's good teaching. He said, I want you to write in this style and, and produce it and bring it back to me. And uh, the various aspects of this America Hurrah, it was split in three, it was a triptych kind of thing. Some of it was like Pinter, some of it was like, you know, I said, do it in that style. So myself and this fellow, he says, I don't want to do any act. I said, you have to do it. <laughs> no, no, I never did it before. I said, all it is is that we're in some unnamed state and I am the, <laughs> you know, prosecutor and I'm going to walk around here. You have to look really frightened. Yeah. We want to do it. Do it! <laughs> well, it turned out to be really stupid. And he got really it. Can I do the prosecutor now? I know. <laughs> And uh, so we wrote this thing out, and, it was really, and I really was fascinated by this because, like a lot of young people that are very troubled, it was a strange time in Ireland, the place was falling to bits, trouble-wise. And I thought, anyway, go to England after this boarding school was over. And just thought, like, first of all, you met two policemen and said, have you got any identification? I said, What's all this? This is like a parody. You know, like, the Irish man arrives in England and is immediately locked up for 40 years. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit much, gentlemen. You know, this is a parody. Can you not do better? <laughs> and uh, they said, have you got any identification? And of course, again, inevitably, what do you have? An old stained letter, you know, all smudged with the rain. Patrick, me. Patrick, mm, yeah. yeah. Patrick said, uh, well, where are you staying? I said, uh, oh, man. No. No, no, some shit or other, yeah. yeah man. Oh, yeah, some shit or other. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I guess. And then you begin to realize, very well, you better smarten up, my young man. You could wind up in a lot of very serious trouble. And then you begin to realize that you're carrying the whole burden of history on you, and the Birmingham bombings happened a couple of years ago. So that was one version of it. Then the second where you come later, it's like a wonderland, you know? So everything is perception, isn't it? And circumstance and so on. But uh, there's, there's no doubt about it that anyone who's experienced love, you can never forget it. It's an astounding place. It's a palimpsest. Of, and, you know, when I eventually started writing Pogma, I realized allow all this in because it's so much a part of you. See, how can you say you're anything, you're Irish, you're English? Because everything you experience becomes part of your identity, doesn't it? Like iron filings to a magnet, you know, as you, an accretion of various identities. You know? Yes, and I mean, the fact that the house that they all stay in is also a temple. <laughs> it's a temple of a, it's a man yeah, of Irish. Yeah. Um, but also that Troy, who is not an Irish character, but a Scottish character, there's a marvelous bit where he, 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 um, he's always telling some story and he's always saying, I, you know, I, I spoke to the, not, not the people in the Who, who, who was the band that he was always talking about? Not the Hoople they were called. Right, the but he knew, he knew these people, he really knew them. And it brought back to me, I knew people who did that, who pretended to know people they didn't know. And that's something to do with the big city. That they say, oh yeah, I, I, I know him, yeah, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I know him. <laughs> And, you know, yeah, he said that to me, yeah. And it was that sort of casual arbitrariness about what is true and not true. And that's about potential and also despair. The two things are kind of, you know, there. In the nature of fiction and reality, because what nobody really mentions is that the narrator of the book yeah. isn't part of this. The narrator of the book is someone unborn. 
Oh, well, that's a t t yeah, you might talk a bit more about that. That's terrible. Well, that's the, the only thing that's important to me because the rest of it is a lot of sort of social realist kind of flim flam. Well, he says he's not born, but. Well, that's again the nature of reality. That's so that, <laughs> that, that's built into it as he well. He says he's sort of born. That's right. He says, I was sort of born. I'm half born, but I'm not really yeah, born. Well, and he tortures his poor sister about it, saying, I wasn't really born. You were born, but I'm not really born. Yeah. And that's because his poor mother. Oh, spoiler alert. You can be well, you know. <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> that doesn't matter. No. He's like, don't you think even in the politics of art, the kind of impertinence of sitting down to write anybody's story, you yeah. know, yeah. has to be questioned. So there's all those kind of political things being asked. Is what you're reading the truth? Who is to say what the truth is anyway? Yes. All those things. And ultimately, when, when it concludes, and kind of a, people were saying, oh, Pogue Mahone, is that like some kind of reference to the Pogues? And all, all this? But also... It's a snarling kind of diabolic paradise lost. Yes. Uh, affront, you know, when Satan confronts the Godhead. Yes. Well, that's what you're dealing with at the end of it. Good, it's, good, it, it good. it's a more Milton-esque than it is, Yes. you know, or at least that's the intention. I'm not saying this was achieved in any way, but, you know, really, like, I suppose I wrote 6,000 handwritten pages trying to find out what this was about. And to think that all I would have to do with my time is write about a couple of hippies in a would-be temple in North London. Well, you know, there are people that could do that far better than me. I mean, for example, one of the influences in a, on it was uh, Ian McEwan's Last Day of Summer. Now, yes. if you want to read about an England that's changing and an England that's, you know, coming to terms with its past and so on, He's the man to read. It's an extraordinary story. It's, uh, it's a bit like um, M.R. James in places. It's a bit like, um, who else would you say? I don't know. Um, Hardy sometimes. It, 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 he is such an extraordinary writer that in terms of, of the social realism come hippie commune, he does more in four pages than I ever would do with that with that particular milieu but I was doing something else yes. at least I thought it was you know but you're also kind of dealing with a kind of metaphysical creature with yeah. this uh, oh yeah well Mr. Eshu is yes, the character the in the Nigerian cu culture yes who has different manifestations like and Sahan in, in that uh, Seven Moons book has a yucca who well, there's so the many same. of them and I, that's why I brought but all the writers are using them now it's very interesting there's something yeah. and even Lincoln and the Bardo that somehow staying on this planet doesn't seem to be quite enough well that you always have to go to this book is by Marina Warner is probably one of yes. the finest minds on this kind of subject it's called once upon a time you know but just a quote from it you know I was hoping this might come up because it kind of explains it to me sometimes you finish a book you know whether you've got it right or not on your own terms, but you don't know really what it's about. You're still trying to figure it out. But she, she writes this in a book called Once Upon a Time, which is a history of fairy tale. And it also deals an awful lot with song, you know, so that's kind of germane to The Butcher Boy, which we've just shown, which is a ballad, which is not Irish, it's English. It's nowhere. It, it, it's like a bird that travels across all frontiers, like she mentions in this book. You don't apply nationality to song, you know, really. But anyway, the poet W.H. Jordan, discussing these imaginary zones, adopted the term secondary world, which had been used by Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and declared, every normal human being is interested in two kinds of worlds. The primary everyday world, which he knows or she knows through their senses, and the secondary world, or worlds which he not only can create in his, his or her imagination, but also cannot stop themselves creating. You know, it's this constant, like, to go back to the Catholic thing, you know, why I think sometimes the whimsy is uh, a little bit, well, it's unsatisfactory, but it's also somewhat disrespectful, I think, and lazy, maybe. But people like in Ireland were always doing this, and they were also <laughs> everywhere. You never see those two things now. And like, uh, what I always found about this, and you get it in Mexico, you get it in Italy, other, 
it was always an acknowledgement that the supernatural and the other world live side by side with this mm. one. Mm. Now we can create all sorts of different versions of this now, but that's all they are, different versions, because mm. I think Marina Warner's right about that. Mm. You know, everybody will talk about reading and being under threat and everything, but everybody reads their child a story at night still, and the child still wants to know what happens at the end. Yeah. You know? And uh, that to me was the, was the poem. And the butcher boy, see, Martin McDonough was saying, when, uh, the great movie he's just done, The Banshees of Inisherin, he didn't know up until the last two pages what was, how it was going to end. But I don't know how you would feel this. Now, we talked enough about me, but I'd like to ask you a question <laughs> with your yeah, wealth of experience. <laughs> but, you know, Arthur Miller has written, you know, he's saying about. The, so there used to be a thing like playwright, didn't there? Like shipwright. That's kind of changed a little bit now as the world changes. But Arthur Miller used to say that you could feel the audience moving as one towards an, a sort of almost religious experience with a great play, one of the great classical players, you've done Medea, that there can't be any other ending. That the audience are going without even saying, of course. And that's almost a kind of a religious kind of mutual obligation mm. kind of thing, mm. which I think has changed to some extent as the world diversifies, maybe trying to reconfigure itself. And why I find myself belonging very much to the Orwell world, you know, where he's talking about this England, which could equally be Ireland, where this thing had been the same for so long, but the digital explosion fragments these things. And perhaps you could argue even further, maybe God is dead. For a lot of people. And does that change things? Or do the Greeks say Aeschylus or Sophocles or Homer or Shakespeare? When the audience of it, sometimes to 10,000 people were operating as a unit. Would you feel a kinship with that? Or is it nonsense? Or are we moving into some other area where it could be even more exciting because the world is diversifying at such a furious rate, mm. and the digital explosion has come. Where would that leave the word of Homer or Shakespeare? Or, or how would it affect it, do you think? I think I'll need about 10 years to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see the point you're making, which is that... Well, I'm trying I think, to make it. A, a I think the theatre has suffered terribly because of that. I think the, the part of the diversification is that there's more film, more fragments, more series, more... So the theatre, but when you talked about that moment, um, of course, in Medea, the genius of Medea is that the audience, through the chorus, agree with everything that Medea says. They go, you're right, you're right, you're right. Mm. And then they think, what? <laughs> but, you know, so when she kills the children, they have to go, you're right, even though that's... Uh, uh, so the, the very darkness of the human mind I I is experienced by the audience. But one of the moments that I remember feeling this sort of religious feeling, which is rare, is not in any of that, but in Brecht's Mother Courage. Mm. And there's a moment halfway through Mother Courage where uh, uh, Swiss cheese, whose Mother Courage's son has been captured, and they drag the body in. And the soldiers say, is this your son? And the audience have, have gone through the whole duplicitousness of, 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 uh, of Mother Courage with her or, or, or her little dealings. And they, they put the body there and they say, is this your son? And if she says yes, her daughter will be killed. And if she says no, she'll have betrayed herself. And the audience so know that, that at the National, we, we did it many, some about 10 years ago, and I used to remember this moment, I, you know, I, I, there was no acting involved. Well, there's, all the acting happens from everybody up to that point. So every thought has to be agreed by the group, i.e. the thousand people in the auditorium. And then they say, is this your son? And the place goes silent. And I could make it silent for as long as I liked. <laughs> but I didn't enjoy the silence. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal, is that this prescient silence as everybody experienced the choice. And that is almost really, I, mean, I remember thinking this is unbelievable writing. And anybody who said that Brecht was, you know, cold or to do with keeping feeling out, the, the opposite was true. There was a kind of, the, the audience is full of feeling. They just, they don't, they have nothing else but feeling. It's thrilling. And uh, the reason I ask is a personal one because 
I was an avid theatre goer, mm. and I found my desire to go to theatre waning. Mm. For this reason, I, I mean, some of the most transformative experiences I've ever undergone were in the theatre, say, the Crucible or, mm. you know, Tom Murphy's The Geely Concert. And there always seems to have been an element of the r ritualistic sacrifice. Mm. And that concept is gone, I think, now from the collective imagination. You know, Philip Larkin talks a lot about the collective subconscious, you know. Mm. And if that's gone, what, is that affecting? I mean, I used to literally haunt it, and now I, I won't go. I mean, I don't know what it is. I came across this thing in uh, Arthur Miller. I don't know if this is old-fashioned or not. I mean, this is from the Paris Review. But this is what he said anyway. This be written about 1966, say, when the world for him was changing dramatically, like he always regarded himself as a kind of a playwright of the 50s, you know, and he woke up one morning and there were all these hippies on the move and the Vietnam War, and he said he felt isolated, you know. But this is what he'd written in 66. Yes, it's got so we've lost the technique of grappling with the world that Homer had, that Aeschylus had, that Euripides had. And Shakespeare also. How amazing it is that the people who adore the Greek drama fail to see that these great works are works of someone confronting their society, the illusions of the society, the faiths of society. And this is the key line for me. The, the, well, the faiths of society. We can def just, like, let's say, since Regan and Thatcher's time, when it became fashionable to say, everyone's on their own. From that period, it seems to me, something happened. No society, yeah. Something like that. But anyway, let's say he was predicting that. The faiths of society. And he's talking about plays. They're social documents, these plays. Not piddling private conversations. And I found myself going to a lot of these plays. It's a piddling private yes. conversation. I'm not interested. And I don't think you deserve my time. We just got educated into thinking this is all a story for its own sake. Mm. It's not. No. Or at least it wasn't to me. You know. Well, various things happened in the theatre. Part of it was that it, they, the rehearsal periods got shorter and shorter because it got too expensive to rehearse things. So mm. people like Peter Brook insisted on having long rehearsal periods. And sometimes early on the National, we had eight or ten weeks on, on, and things were so much better when they had that time. So you had time to go wrong and time to go right. So you had time to discover the thing. If you're just putting something on, you're only going to get the, the surface of it. But when you talk about that Greek audience thing, I once played um, Beckett's Happy Days at Epidavros in Greece. And, you know, normally our theatres here, the biggest theatre you have would be about 1,000 people. But in Greece, there was 8,000 people in the audience <laughs> without microphones and buried up to my neck. But it was the most thrilling thing was to be in that silence and have seven or 8,000 people. And I had a sort of Pogue Mahon moment in that while I was doing it, I, some, I began to think of the people, not just in their jeans and T-shirts, but in togas. I thought, I can see them all in mm. kind of togas. And it, it, it's part of the joy of playing to 7,000 people is it's a, village, a town of people, is that they've all traveled from somewhere to get to that space to listen to that argument or story. Or, you know, to, and of course, it can't be a story for a story. It's something about them. And uh, it's a whole community meeting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're all doing that in our sitting rooms now watching TV series, but we're not in a community at all. The cinema still, in theory, is that a little bit. You're on the dark. I found in that respect that Martin McDonough's film, The Banshees of Inishurin, was quite extraordinary. Yeah. Following on from what you were saying, like, you don't often hear that gasp in cinema any longer. But yeah. When I was at it, and this is in the world, you know, of, you know, wild digital imagery of video games. And here's a story. Yeah. Well, what's it about? I don't like you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's about. And I thought, where is he going to go with this? And we are not going to spoil any of this, but it's an extraordinary film. It's one of the best movies I think ever made, actually. I really That's do. a wonderful thing to say about it. I really do think so. Yeah. And uh, I think time will tell that. Because it ends, cyclical, is this the end? 
This is just the start. And what that is, I think, is Gogol, the squabble, you know, where these two guys are arguing unto infinity. I think it's Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah. And John. I thought, just when you're lamenting the death of something, there it goes. Something comes up, which is the magic. And this is not a dirge. I'm just trying to figure out something. But uh, I definitely think that one thing you can say for sure is that what makes that movie is the writing. Oh, it yes. would be nothing without the writing. I mean, the performance is astonishing. But it's a lyrical poem, really. Oh, yeah. You want to read the yeah, text. There's yeah. one section where somebody says, well, that's not very nice. What do you mean it's not nice? Well, it's not nice. And the fact that the word nice, you know, which would be normally a writer's yeah. you know, bombshell, wouldn't it? They could yes. hear yeah. the word nice. Yes. And there's a whole scene about people using the word nice. But it's masterly in that and way. And you, again, getting back to the, the bowron or the hand drum, for anyone who doesn't know what a bowron might be, he has a lyrical beat into everything. The repetitions mm. are what give it. And you, you, you become, once you get it, isn't it? Once the first five minutes, you get yeah. the key that you're in. Then th that's the magical zone. And I genuinely think when the author speaks that he didn't know himself, then you're in the, in the realm of magic. Yeah. L like when children yeah. uh, get into a zone. Yeah. Like I remember when our daughter was very young, I was vamping on the piano and she had her back turned to me, and I had a sort of a country and western beat going. And she went, I know you from a distant planet, aliens coming around. Oh, there they're coming. Oh, don't you come and steal me. And I thought, my God, that's brilliant. And I turned around and said, see, and she stopped. The magic was broken. And I think it's, it's as simple as that with authors, really. Yeah. 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 I think. The childlike kind of magic of that. Well, what do you mean you don't like me anymore? You liked me yesterday, or did you? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. what's your boys put it that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The very right. right. you were my yeah. friend, and you're not my friend. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 But there's also you have it in Pope Mahone too. You have these repetitions of words like drip, drip, drop, drip, drop. But it made me think of the wasteland. That did. Well, I was thinking of the wasteland also. Yeah. And the wasteland has, has a has huge influence now. If Mr. Elliot was here tonight, I'd say, God bless you, sir, you're a great man for giving me all them lines. But a lot of it was subconscious. And it ended up in Margate because yes. of T.S. Elliot, where he wrote the, in the bus shelter. So you'd hardly know a bit of that, would you? I would, but, yeah, but I want to do the bit, bit about the drips. I read this drip bit, and because every now and then a character says something like, well, like in the wasteland, there's a lot of uh, showing off of the wasteland in the book by Troy, mainly. But uh, there, uh, uh, and there's this very arid bit in the wasteland. It's the most arid bit. It's the most unsocial bit. There's lots of social bits, you know. But there's, um, you know, my nerves are bad tonight and all that. But there's this bit. Here is no water, but only rock. Rock and no water, and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock, without water. If there were water, we would stop and drink. Without water, we can't stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there was only water amongst the rock, dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit, here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. But there is no water. Sorry, I've gone, I need, I've gone back too far, sorry. <laughs> If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and only water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there was a sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock, where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. Um, have, you got, have you got the book? No. He have, has, but, but in I mean, the book, there's a bit where I, he has... I have a book, but it's not my book. Oh, it's not your book. And, uh, you know, I'm not a great one for promotion or, or any of these no. things or reading from your books. But I do like, like, like reading from, from works that mean an awful lot to me, like The Wasteland does. And uh, I won't go into any detail, but I had a bit of bad health there recently. And I know that people sometimes say things, oh, poetry will help you through, and so on. 
and I didn't really believe it, but a friend gave me this book by Clive James. Mm. And I carry it everywhere with me now. Um, I can't quote it or speak it as magnificently as Fiona, but I only quote it because we're here to talk about art and what it means. And uh, I found this poem called Landfall to be the equal of Philip Larkin, and I don't say that lightly. And I don't think uh, Clive James needs any introduction, really. You know, he was a highly regarded figure for many years, and God rest his soul now. But this is called Landfall, anyway. Hard to believe now that I once was free from pills and heaps, blood tests, x-rays and scans, no pipes or tubes. At perfect liberty, I stained my diary with travel plans. The ticket paid for at the other end. I packed a hold all and went anywhere they asked me. One on whom you could depend to show up, I would cross the world by air and come down neatly in some crowded hall. I stood for a full hour to give my spiel. Here, I might talk back to a nuisance call, and that's my flight of eloquence, unreal. But those years in the clear, how real were they? <laughs> when all the sirens in the signing queue who clutched their hearts at what I had to say were just dreams, even when the dream came true. I called it health, but never stopped to think it might have been a kind of weightlessness, that footloose feeling always on the brink of breakdown, the false freedom of excess. Rarely at home in those days, I'm home now, where few will look at me with shining eyes. Perhaps none ever did. And that was how the fantasy of young strength that now dies expressed itself. The face that smiled at mine out of the looking glass was seeing things. Today I am restored by my decline and by the harsh awakening it brings. I was born weak and always have been weak. I came home and was taken into care a cot case, but at long last I can speak. I am here now, who was hardly even there. Oh. Mm. Yeah. It's weird, we, we so know Clive James from the television, isn't it? We so, we so got to know him on a, you know, being so witty and funny. And, and that's how he saw himself until, until, until the real writer came through, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Don't you agree? Yes. Because I used to enjoy it, but I thought, probably in today's world it's a little bit suspect anyway. Yeah. You know, you're looking at various cultures from the world, isn't this funny? Yeah. I mean, once upon a time, that was the Irish, you know, and it's not very nice, really, a lot of that. Yeah. And um, he just said... What did all that mean? Yeah. All these people lining up to get their book signed. You know. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty harrowing, but unlike Larkin, who actually kept saying, oh, when I get sick and never get sick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Larkin, get sick. Get sick. <laughs> For Christ's sake, will you just go and get into the ambulance? Yeah. <laughs> then you may have something different to say. There, Jesus. Yes. And then, Clive James comes along with this. I mean, it's good to have them both, I think. He wrote that late. Yeah. yeah. It's called Sentence to Life. He was, yes. He, he was terminally ill with leukemia. Yes, and then he kept on not dying too, didn't he? He kept on saying, I'm not dying. And I Come on, guys. Leukemia. He was, <laughs> Jesus. <yeah. laughs> that goes back to your Margate, your Margate thing where, where, where 
the Pope Mahone takes place in a kind of a home in Margate, though it doesn't matter that it is, but it is Margate, and you keep mentioning Margate. But in the wasteland, Elliot, you know, I don't know how many lines the wasteland is, but the middle line of the whole thing is on Margate Sands, mm. I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands, my people, humble people who expect nothing. La la! To cartage, then I came, burning, 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 burning. And that's that, isn't it? It absolutely is, and they all connect, I hope, because what you're saying about the Catholicism and then the absurd drama, like in a way, it's a bit like Henry James said, uh, if a writer's worth anything, someone on whom nothing is lost. So everything that your experience gives you, whether it's the kind of long traditional kind of vista of Irish Catholicism or any Catholicism or high Ang Anglicanism, whatever it is, all these things have meant an awful lot to an awful lot of people. So you, you kind of take... And then when the absurd drama and modernism and Joyce and Edith, I mean, it gets very exciting then when, when you ha have come through those various... Epo and now we're into something else. Now, but I find that the speed with which it's moving, you know, but it, we're fortunate to have three grandchildren. And already you can, you can see ahead into what this... There are jobs and kind of... Uh, obsessions that they have, like w one of our grandchildren, like he's doing stop motion on the YouTube, right? And I said, oh, I'll show you Ray Harryhausen. He in oh, who's he, Dad? Right? I said, he invented stop motion. Okay. So I showed it to him. So there's Jason and the Argonaut. <laughs> and the guy's going, oh. Oh, God. And uh, I said, no, Christopher, he invented yeah, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, he, and then he goes There's, to his own machine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the multiverses, right? <laughs> and you, you just don't know how to do about that because yeah. I'd kind of educated him on Marvel comics, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, he used to kind of say, OK, we do Spider-Man, J. John and Jemison and Batman. So, and I used to get very excited about it, you know, the Fantastic Four and so on. He was very interested for a while, but one day I could see he was a little bit anxious, a little bit agitated. And I could see him trying to figure out what it was he was going to say, but he slowly edged his way kind of obliquely around. He arrived at the edge of the sofa and said, Granda. I said, yeah, what? I don't really know I tell you this, but I don't really want to do that old stupid Fantastic Four stuff anymore. <laughs> and, I, I, and I said, why? He said, it's a different Fantastic Four. And so he... Yeah. It was too static for him. Yes. It was a bit like the sort of banshees of Enna Sharon moment yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. a little bit of me died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but now that he's educating me in the, in the multiverse, it's equally fascinating. But I just don't have the agility of mind to cope with it, really. But it's very exciting. Well, you, know, you, so. you do. I think Paul Mahone is full of, full of that kind of thing, but your well, book... maybe a sort of a kinetic energy of yeah, some description, yeah. yeah. But yeah. You know, when you think of Queen's Park, or the whole area that you write about in Paul Mahone, that, that isn't nostalgia, is it? It's almost like ancient no. history nostalgia being encapsulated. No, nostalgia is no use. It's, no, because no, your grandson won't have... Uh, will read that and go, what? <laughs> is this... Yeah, but if, if your writing is worth anything, and I, I, I spent a lot of time making sure that the butcher boys, such as it was, would not fall into that trap of retro, you know, spectre kind of nostalgia for this. Ha it had to inhabit a mythic space. Yes. You know. And when it concludes, it should be like a Greek conclusion. You know, that the, the, the uh, inmates are like a siren chorus or, you know, I've always been interested in that for the reasons that I've been trying to elucidate, you know, with Eliot and the Greeks and all the... It is no use writing what it was like, you know, when the Troubles were on in the 70s or when people wore condoms in Ireland, ha, 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 you know, or didn't wear them or whatever the hell it was. You know, that's why I, I just find it so interesting what, uh, what Arthur Miller has to say and how right he is or how wrong he is, because th this is a debate that must continue, and it, it's a very invigorating and exciting time, this, but it's just, uh, it, it's so hard to, it's like a moving object, really, you know. 
No, the, the great thing, the butcher boy, which I was reminded of when, uh, as we were meeting, is that at the very moment that the chorus, who are the people of the town, mm. think they're going to see God or the Virgin Mary, instead they see the pitilessness of seeing a person dead. That's, a, that's marvelous. They, they meet themselves in their ugliness, don't they? They all run into a house thinking it's the Virgin. In fact, it's a, it's going to be, it's a dead body. And that's a very good coup because it means that both stories are going together all the way through. Yeah. You know? And that happened too in ordinary life. You know, the people, the church going people, would have a, con a contemplativeness that's not often acknowledged. It seems, again, to get back don't want to be unkind about it, it's as if this has only been discovered in the current era, whether it's mindfulness or yeah. some, you know, figure. But built into the, I remember a lot of these people would have attended the Latin Mass, and I remember as a child being fascinated by the idea, one uh, old lady said to me that the most harrowing moment for the human being is when God turns his face away. I had this image, but a bit like X-Men or something, mixed up with all that. A huge kind of Mount Rushmore figure slowly turned. And that is a metaphor for the pain you would be feeling that turns up in the Banshees of Inish, the moment when the space becomes unbridgeable. Yeah. And that's in theater of, it's in every, all these things, none of them are new, let's face it. So whether it's the eternal verities or whatever it might be. And I think, you know, it's very difficult to get a space to where, where these things can be discussed because um, the notion of morality or how you teach morality, huh? <laughs> whatever, you know, okay, that's fine, I get that, but Jesus, come on, you know, for just once could we have a serious conversation <laughs> about these things? Mm -hmm. oh. Speaking of spaces oh, we're being for we're things not being to be discussed, mm -hmm. I hate to break up a happy party, but we will be continuing it, but just with questions from all of you at home and in the room. Um, before we do, not to break up the conversation, but thank you so much already for this <laughs> extraordinary conversation. We have some microphones coming round to you, so please, please. Uh, put your hands up if you've got a question. We're looking for questions, not comments. Famously, comments. questions, not comments. Oh, we've got a question just here. Oh, Fiona, you touched on theatre just now. And you were implying, I think, that something is hugely changed but you didn't say what? Uh, well, I, I don't think I, I would dare to um, pronounce on the theatre. I think the great thing about the theatre, it'll always renew itself. But the theatre, as Pat was talking about, about a theatre where you went in order to, you know, experience those moments, like in Dancing at Lunasa, when they all the women start dancing, and somehow the, the the evening is freed of language, but is, is transcendent in what happens. That's very hard to get in a world in which we're all at home watching the television or watching screens. That's all. And I think, I mean, all sorts of obvious things like the pandemic and, you know, people stopped being friendly with the person next to them to watch it and mm. became hostile to the That's person right, watching yeah. it. And if you are wearing a mask and you're, you're in refusal to the person left and right in you, you're miles off what the Greek theater was. Uh, I mean, you're just not one unit, you're separate people. So I think there's a lot of challenge for the theatre at the moment. And, and I also think the economics of the theatre have become really, really agony for a lot of people in it. I think um, you, you just can't throw plays up and expect them to land. They're mm. not going to land. You have to, really, mm. you have to really find out what's going on. I mean, most plays exist because you're matching the period you're in, not intellectually, but subconsciously, actually. I mean, that's why some of the best performances are between people's age of 28 and 35. It, it, uh, 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 it's because somehow you're in tune with your time in those mm. times. And the most interesting work is done by, they often say, directing as a young man's job, woman's job, whatever. But it's, um, so I think it's, it's under a lot of pressure. 
And also, I mean, wonderful things have happened in the theatre. I think Black Lives Matter is one of the most wonderful movements to have happened because it means that a whole other group of people whose culture has not been investigated enough by the theatre is being and will be. And I think that's a fantastic... Then the theatre is a tool that will actually turn history or reshape... We'll have another look at history or... So I think there's some very good things happening as well. I'm going to take a question from our online audience and then we're going to come online. down to the front. Okay. Um, Elaine would love to know if you have any tips for how to get modern children to appreciate classic children's literature. <laughs> What's I a think classic you, I child? think he's answered that, hasn't he? With his <laughs> Don't read Marvel. <laughs> No, it, it, is a, it is a problem, that, because I have noted that, even if I own that the, the texts you would have expected children, even for the alarm for the fact that people are sentimental about their own childhoods, I would have expected children to know about Alice in Wonderland and uh, the Greek fairy tales and Hans Christian Andersen and various of And they don't. Now, the big question is now, are they bereft in any way? It's a bit early to say, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what the answer is because uh, I've tried giving them to the particular individual with whom I have this <laughs> fractious <laughs> banshee severe in this year of relationship. And I give them, I don't know what it was, something like that. Oh, yeah. So. I don't know whether it's becoming a... Maybe they don't need to. You know, they're also they exposed to you know, Asian literature and yeah. African literature and characters from all over the world that we weren't. I mean, when you say Alice in Wonderland, you know, it would be a sort of absolute thumbprint for uh, many people. You would have in a white world, in a very white Ang Anglo-Saxon world. Well, I never really figured out what colour she was. I wasn't really that interested. No, it's like, the colour um, that's about the... Um, I was just interested. It's about the in nature that. of fear, isn't it? It's a particular kind of fear. Yeah. You see a white rabbit. I'm always seeing white rabbits. At the <laughs> you always know a white rabbit, and you know something's up. And that's, but that's a complete cultural trope. Yeah. I think we're ready for our next question. Well, wasn't there a guy called Percy something who wrote the adventure stories with the Greeks? My nephew was full of Jackson. Percy Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. Jackson, My nephew yeah. knew all about Percy Jackson. <laughs> yeah. He did a lot of that. We're going to our next question. Well, we didn't answer that one very well, no, we did we? <laughs> just, just beat them and make them read them. Just say, read that. Make them read yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to draw together just a couple of strands. So this is a question, not a statement. But nostalgia and myth, the difference between the two, I happen to be Welsh. And I'm afraid that we haven't got that right at all. And I'm thinking about time and Hilary Mantel's comment about the um, what's past is ever with us, but also irretrievable. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted, Fiona, you mentioned, when was anything ever steady? Uh, well, at least that's my question, because you said that, th th I think that was what you actually said, when was anything ever steady? I'm wondering if anything ever has been, in terms of time and the, uh, the unconscious and how we write and what comes through us. Is it always flow or is anything ever steady? Just the small questions this evening then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Pat will have more to say about this, but I, I, I mean, I, I might be wrong because you, know, you self-mythologize yourself, but I've always thought that I came from somewhere so boringly steady that I was interested in exploring a world which was less steady. Um, but that's partially because I was brought up in the 70s in Cork where nothing happened at all for 10 years, just nothing happened. Of, <laughs> nothing of any kind happened ever. <laughs> nothing happened. Um, I, I, P Pat was in a much more uh, volatile part of the country. No, I don't agree with that. I, I, think that um, <laughs> I, I think that a small uh, town of 2,000 people on the southern side of the border where nothing happened either. Nothing happened either. Um, you know, it would be a mistake to think that, you know, I somehow survived kind of a, a terrifying war zone, you know, yeah, no, like no. 
a three-legged dog running <laughs> past the house was a pretty it's much about, a big event, event, you know. I wouldn't, <laughs> so, but, but where I would, to, to link the two things, the question and what you're saying, you know, to quote Larkin again, Larkin, you know, always insisted that Hull was his place, and he, he loved the dullness of Hull, he kept yes. saying. He used it as a weapon almost. But philo philosophically, he was right, though, that he, he said that something like nothing can happen anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And I mean, I don't want to keep on about the banshees, but what happens on that island? <laughs> Two guys fall out. You know, that's all. I don't like you anymore. How, how do you make a play out of that? How do you make one of the great pieces of art out of that? And nothing much happens, you know, in, in so many great works of art, except the inner life is changed and you come out yes. a different person. And so I think the nature of things is that it's a constant flux. You know, a hundred yes. years means nothing. I mean, all, all right, in our time, nothing much happened, but, you know, um, the flow has speeded up, I think, in our, in our, in our last, say, 40 years. This is like the Industrial Revolution, isn't it, really? Yes. You know, things shifted. They go at different speeds, but it's a constant. It's never, never steady, ever, I would yeah. think. Not to me, anyway. Um, and maybe that's what art is, an attempt to just st s s sort of dam up the river and, and, and tame the chaos for a while and impose some kind of order so that you can leave a legacy of some kind behind you, like a, a cave painting for, for uh, succeeding generations. But certainly it's, a, it, it's one of fluidity and flux rather than stasis for me. Yes. And I think also when you come out of something that seems a cocoon and you look above the parapet, you see there's plenty flux, you know. Yeah. The world is in, in yeah. chaos and people's suffering is endless and there's only meaning in suffering, you know, rather than um, trying to find meaning out of suffering. And sometimes suffering is self-inflicted and sometimes it really isn't. Yeah. Sorry, that doesn't answer your question at all, but we need about five years for that. <laughs> Can I take another question? I'm looking to the back of the room. Anybody at the back of the room? Okay, we've just got somebody right at the front of the room. I've, I've lied to you all. Just this person here. Thank you. But back of the room, you will get your moment. Get ready. Um, have you read anything lately that you would like to recommend to us tonight? Well, I'd certainly recommend Clive James' Sentence to Life if you're interested in poetry, but um, I don't think there's any uh, problem finding really good literature at the moment. There's, there's so much of it. I'm not no, looking just on that. in your opinion, that something that moved you personally. The Seven Moons. I think that mm. wonderful Booker Prize winning book is a fantastic, rumbustious, chaotic book about the chaos. Uh, it, you know, it's set in Colombo and Sri Lanka, but actually it's about everything. I read Annie Arnaud's book, The Years, recently, and that seems so much more steady than, than, than Pope Mahonis, the opposite, because it deals with the same period. And she says things like, you know, Simone de Beauvoir died and we were a bit sad. <laughs> and you think, God, compared to this... I, mean, I was a bit too, sad, too. Yeah, I was a bit sad. I was sad, too. Sartre won't go on television. You know, you get... So, you know, <laughs> yeah, you well. get... I mean, France was, was, was not the same place as London or mm. Ireland in the 70s. Well, actually, she writes brilliantly, I think, about the fact that, you know, they were all go on six, in 1968, and then within five years, they were all going to Carrefour, filling their cars up with shopping for the and weekend and wondered what happened there, passions. And I, but, but, you know, that's, maybe everything is in relation to everything else. You know, if you read that and you read Pope Mahone, you think, goodness me, the world is... Full of different things. <laughs> yeah. The next question. Oh, we've got one just over here. So I don't know if you want to throw the microphone over towards a green jumper. I'll try not to mess this up. I'll try and say it really quickly so it comes out like I was thinking it, but not so quick that it just is garbled and nonsense. Um, so, Pat. Um, so I'm laughing out uh, loud a lot during this Pope Mahone thing, and I'm reading it really slowly, and um, it's because I'm laughing so much. But I actually find the book quite scary. Um, it's very frightening, actually, a lot of the spaces and the rooms and just the, the, 
the moments, uh, I don't know what it is, it feels haunted or something, but what I'm actually uh, laughing about a lot is my own friends, and this is more sort of London in the 90s and noughties, and even up until recently enough, been tipping into the, the tweens or whatever they call them. And that's funny, so you're laughing about, I'm laughing about real life stuff and all the crack that I've had in London and all the stuff that's probably passed now and I can't go back and thank God for that. Yeah. But, but whilst reading about this terrifying stuff from the 70s, from the temple in Mahara Vishnu or whatever it is. <laughs> and it's reminded me a little bit about that guy you told me about in uh, Stray Sod Country, the, the guy who kept coming back to the jukebox and telling stories about London who was lying or maybe not. No, he was, he was nostalgia. And then was, that was a good point about mythology just made there from the second row. Is that what it is? It's like you can build up nostalgia for th places you weren't in mm. and then you're going to mythologize about your own, not quite, your dreams didn't quite come true or it was never that quite exciting or it was really exciting, but actually it was terrible. So I don't know, it is a question a little bit, but also, yeah, is it a repeated Cycle, well, I suppose think. I'm trying to figure out, you know, make sense of the world that you inherited, and not just, in my case, a small town or Ireland or England or anywhere else, but the nature of reality, you know. And uh, a big thing at the period of Pope Mahone, of course, would have been psychedelic drugs, you know, and of course it was de rigueur for young artists that time to partake of lysergic acid dialthamide, you know, and if you apply that to the vision of, shall we say, the rural inheritance of writing, you know, shall we say, John McGarhan or William Trevor, and you're bringing in the absurd theatre, well, then I suppose that's an attempt to create your own style or to make it, because there was no point, I could have, with the life that I was living and trying to emulate the generation previous to that because, as we were saying about the absurd theatre and so things were fragmenting. But there was a psychedelia anyway as part of that kind of 50s, 60s generation because I remember this guy said to me, out of the blue, when we were having a drink in the bar, and he looked like a teddy boy. You know when people are kind of in their 60s but they carry a little bit of the ghost of the teddy bear that once was with the duck's ass and the winkle pickers but he's working you know in a meat factory or something now or <laughs> might be retired and he said out of the blue he said the biggest disappointment in my life really he said was that I didn't get the job with the who yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I said, what, what did you say <laughs> Yeah, sure. That's the way it goes, he said. I said, you mean like Pete Townsend in the Who? Yeah. Nice fella, he said. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this guy, I don't know what acid he's taken, but I want some of this. <laughs> and uh, then he said, I probed him and bought him a drink. I said, uh, did you get talking to him for a long time? Right while he said, yeah. And uh, how did it happen? He said, well, I seen the ad in the paper and everything. And uh, thought I'll tip down and see. Sure, I played with a few show bands and I'd have as good a chance as anybody else. I went down and I said, Pete, what time can I go on at? And Pete Townsend said, well, we have two or three more to see, but we could see you maybe after 12 o'clock if you want to go and have a drink there in West Hampstead pub. Now, interestingly enough, when the West Hampstead aspect came in, I thought, that's where the Who used to rehearse, I thought. This, what? <laughs> so he um, then went on to say, I had one round anyway, and uh, we did a few numbers like Summertime Blues and Come On Everybody, and... Uh, I, did, I beat the skins good, he said. I beat them good. But the fucking thing about it was, he said, I had the job, only that wee moon fella <laughs> came in. <laughs> and uh, he said, Jesus, he was good. <laughs> he was good. And I said, what did he play? Oh, he did a couple. Now, all of the thing was starting to make sense. He said he played Gene Vincent. He knew his stuff, this guy. And he said... 
that Keith Moon got the job and he went up and he shook his hand and said, good on play. <laughs> Now, I went out of there thinking, what I had thought was a big psycho was a psychedelic kind of uh, f uh, fabrication turned out to be actually, <laughs> every word of it was true. <laughs> and he had been working on the buildings, you know, and gone down and done all this. And so there's a little town. You see this guy a thousand times a day and you'd never believe. Yeah. So I became fascinated, and that's what ended up with the butcher party, the inner lies of people yeah. that you will never know about. And if art has any pur purchase or purpose in the world, it's like Joyce said, he never met anybody that was uninteresting, yeah. ever. And I, that's a pretty good principle to live your life by. Yeah. And it's why I kind of have a little bit of a problem with this retrospection of the 40s, 50s, and 60s in Ireland. It really is quite lazy, I think. And uh, I think although it's, it's not a crusade of any kind of art, but it, it, it's kind of beneath the dignity of art to be making these assumptions when you don't know the inner lives of people. But to get back, the rest of the question statement was a kind of that if there was a kind of a, an attempt to lasso a style, it would be that, in the words of Vladimir Nabokov, when he was talking about Gogol, he said, the end of the day, not only do you afford them the dignity which they merit, but they should stand out colossal against the big sky of everything. Oh, Something yeah. like that. Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. From, from an online an online audience question. Uh, so William, who's been watching at home, would like to say how wonderful it's been to hear you both read and recite some poetry this evening. And uh, he acknowledges that Pat says he, he, he isn't a poet and doesn't write poetry, but would like to know, Fiona, if you have ever tried writing poetry yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're moving swiftly on to another question. Okay, we have one question here, and then we're going to finish up with a last question from our online audience. So submit your final questions if you're watching at home. Hi, my question is for both of you. Um, what's your first book that you read, and what's your favourite Irish author? Maybe we might have to stick to one timing wise. So we might go, what was your, the first book that meant something to you when you read it? Mine was the dandy book. <laughs> um, I still read it. I think it's the best book ever written, even better than Ulysses. And I'm not being whimsical because every time I look at it, I see a, a sort of a psychedelic post-war Britain just, just after uh, the day and then was that a comic, page. the dandy? Well, it was a dandy annual. Annual, yeah. Yeah. What year? 19, 1961. <laughs> 1961, yeah. Get because on eBay immediately. It's like, but it, it's oh a bit God. like Ulysses. It very. <laughs> I love that response. <laughs> and the reason I say it's a bit like Ulysses is, I mean, what is Ulysses? Only all these different styles of stories, and you know, some of them are funny, some of them are scary, some of them are incomprehensible. And if you turn the first couple of pages, you know, in the dandy book, 1964, you will see the Crimson Ball. And that's a bit like <laughs> Circe. The Circe episode in Ulysses, Dada-esque, Dada isn't it, really? And then, you know, you go, you go to the next page, and that's Dirty Dick or The Smasher, and that's a little bit like, uh, I suppose, the uh, Nausicaa episode of Ulysses, <laughs> you know, which is kind of fun, of fun, all these funny little romantic kind of things. Yeah. And there's all sorts of parallels. I didn't really mean to say any no. of this, but now that I think of it. <laughs> you feel more strong. <laughs> I think, I think that, John right. and Pat, you know what the next project after this yeah, book so. is. Uh, Fiona, what was your but, first? I mean, if we're going to, get to that level, I, we, <laughs> we were only allowed, um, uh, in terms of comics, we were only allowed look and learn because the, you know, my parents were aspirational. <laughs> so I would get, I would go to a bring and buy and buy a pile of dandies and, that's more for my brother, and I would buy bunties. 
Uh, you could get big, huge rolls of them for maybe a penny or something. And then I would go home and suddenly get a really bad pain in my tummy. Yeah. I have to Sick go to bed, Mom. <gasps> so bed. And I'd Sick be in the bed because we weren't allowed by them. But I would say probably, not Rupert Bear, but I think Winnie the Pooh is probably the first thing I can really, really remember. Or the Children of Lear. That was my favourite. I think, you know, going back to the earlier question about how do you get children to uh, read these, mm. because here's the answer to that question, and apologies for not knowing this earlier on. But mm. Our other grandchild has a thing called a pony, a Tony box. Did you ever hear of this? Mm. Well, you get Winnie the Pooh, and you put it on top of the Tony box. Hello. The voice comes out through the thing, and the music comes. It was a blastery day. And she lays back, and she is, in the digital age, wrapped in this thing. Yeah. And she goes to her life, and she, the other day she came to visit us, and she said, Oh, how long is this day? <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's good, yeah. So I would recommend this Tony box. Tony box, I think, yes. you know, it's yes, a popular it's thing. And you can, like, if you wanted to get... Pogue Mahone on the Tony <laughs> box. Yes. You could put a little hippie up there and go... <laughs> oh, Electra in there, isn't it? The <laughs> light of the morning, sky yeah. canopy above, yeah. the shadows of night <laughs> melt into day, hear me? <laughs> the box. Yeah, I think that's a winner. Of that <laughs> that's a winner. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're going to prevail upon you for one, one final question from our online audience. Um, so perhaps following on from that, Elizabeth says thank you both for such an inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. Um, she would love to know how when we're engaging uh, with things via the screen more, how do we ensure that we are an active aspect of the creative act and not just a passive passenger? Well, that's the big question, isn't it, that we've been yes. trying to parse and analyze that, you know, as you're saying about the uh, communal response to the, well, the sacrifice of the transcendent moment. That, that is the big question of the, of the consumer age. How do you stop being a passive consumer? the next Netflix, the next 10 parts here, you know, it becomes one big tub of angel delight mainlined into the body <laughs> spiritual, isn't it? <laughs> so true. I don't know. Stop eating angel delight, maybe. <laughs> you know, I remember years ago, Peter Hall saying that very soon people wouldn't be able to read uh, iambic pentameter, and then they wouldn't be able to hear iambic pentameter. Mm. And, you know, I wonder if people soon won't be able to read. Um, they'll be so used to watching flickering images on the screen, and that's exactly... No, I think that's true, and I think... But we still could be active participants, couldn't we? It's funny, what, what would be under threat, certainly in an Irish context and various other... I remember discussing this about the advent of uh, the, the digital and consumer or computer age with an African writer, and I was talking about... Um, I noticed... Let's say all that jibber-jabber that goes on in the butcher boy, oh, diddly did all that stuff. That's a kind of a currency that keeps people together, you know. And uh, now, when I come out with these things, like when I said I was in hospital there recently and somebody said, oh, are you all right? I said, I'm like the man that couldn't hang. <laughs> and they said, who's he? Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> and this woman in her 40s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, that was a very common thing, like, how are you doing today, Joe? Ah, Jesus, I'm like the man that couldn't hang. hang. <laughs> and everybody understood it, so they be yeah. bouncing this stuff around. Yeah. No, that is, so you're kind of looking at the oral culture, and the African, he noticed that in his place as well, that the oral culture was being flattened out. Yes, yes. You know, so, no, I'm not saying this is a tragedy, because you can come out with all these, you know, funny qua <laughs> spakes and everything else, but, you know, People being better educated, people have better, all these things that, that get rid of, they're not about, you know, to, to trade, you know, good health care for funny little, you know, specks in an Irish village. Yeah. You know. yeah. Why should they? Yeah. But it, it's nonetheless important, you know, to, to note these things and see wh where does language go next. And you can be sure it'll go somewhere interesting, yeah. as it always does. It mutates. I mean, there's uh, plenty of movies that, you know, have youth culture kind of Argo in them that I wouldn't be privy to, but that's language, you know, as it's probably out of fashion, but I love when, when young people say, that's sick, that's really sick. <laughs> I mean, that, we never said things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they are using it, yeah. Well, there's so many things you yeah. wouldn't have said, you know, but uh, that's because we're old timers now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I hate, I hate to break up a party, but, uh, and I know that we could all listen to you for hours longer, but we've all got homes to go to. Um, so before I wrap up for this evening, I just want us all to thank Fiona and Patrick so much for this thank conversation. You. And Pat, I know, I know that you aren't in for lots of self-promotion, but I hope you won't mind if I do a bit of RSL promotion and then a bit of you promotion as well. I'll be very quick, I promise. Um, so this is the RSL's first in-person event of a busy spring season, and we could have no better advert to encourage you to join us as a member. Uh, our memberships and passes are open to everyone and start at just £25 a year and you get free tickets to join us in person or online, whatever your preference is. Uh, be sure to sign up online on the RSL website for, and uh, if you want a particular uh, special discounted World Book Day rate, uh, you can sign up at our membership, membership desk tonight uh, with our Head of Operations, Martha Stenhouse, who will be happy to oblige. Uh, please also join Patrick downstairs now to buy all of his books. Hey. They're very heavy. Don't make yes. anybody pack them away again. You, we can Many hands, light work and all of that. Uh, Patrick will be signing shortly, so please join us downstairs. Uh, all that remains is for me to thank Unique Media and Blue Box for managing the live stream and the tech tonight the British Library, Unbound, uh, and our volunteers, and a special thanks to our events and partnerships manager, Lily Blacksall, for making this evening possible. And so now, finally, finally, please join me in a final, final thank you to Fiona Shaw and Patrick oh, no, McCabe. No. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Already?